quite frankly, what Vermont should do, if, if, if I had to have one silver bullet of a gem from Bob Barton, I would say we need to work to force every utility in the state to do on-bill tariff financing. The first thing you have to really do if you want to be successful and make money in energy, and I certainly didn't make any money the first 10 years I did this, was is to figure out, can you get this freaking thing financed? Even though there's a lot of money out there, ARA funds and others, it's very hard to get the commercial sector to want to borrow. You know, and the public sector is in disarray because we don't have any tax base anymore. Uh, I could say a great thing that's actually happened, which is not on my slides, is that a group called Tioga, T-I-O, GA, GA Energy out of San Francisco just put their, their purchase power agreement into the public domain. Solar's got a huge, bright, bright, bright future. And even though I've been thought of that 30 years ago when I started this, it's really the time. We're at the right time now. So my name is Ralph Mima, and I'm, I'm very pleased to uh, see you all here this evening and welcome you. I'm the director of the Marlboro MBA program in managing for sustainability. And that's one of a number of programs here at the graduate school. Um, we have uh, a, a student intensive about once a month. There are actually 10 a year. And what we have typically done is um, almost every time, this is the 32nd intensive since the launch of our program three years ago. And most of the time on Friday evening, we have a speaker. And I have the great pleasure this evening of welcoming Bob Barton. Um, Bob bring, brings uh, over 30 years of experience in energy efficiency, renewable energy, and environmental financing. He characterizes himself as a green investment banker. He's the CEO of Catalyst Financial Group um, that have worked, have pioneered several energy-related finance mechanisms that have resulted in billions of dollars in energy financing. Um, currently, Bob and his business partner, Neil Zobler, advised 25 city, town, and state governments on how to use their ARRA, ERA, or, or uh, bailout you know, um, <laughs> money, or stimulus money. Stimulus, right. stimulus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the car companies. <laughs> bailout hasn't come yet. Um, set up innovative finance programs, and, the, and they are the exclusive uh, financial advisors to, these, to the EPA's Energy Star program, and have been for the past 10 years. Um, Something else I just wanted to mention that I found interesting is that Bob, Bob has been involved in, in socially responsible business or social, social causes related to business and money for a long time. And talking with Bob earlier this week, I learned that Bob is a founding member of the Social Venture Network and also a founding member of Investor Circle, which I think for many of our students um, put him in other parts of our map that are very central to, to our whole MBA pro, uh, program's approach. And uh, he is also a founding investor in the socially responsible lending program of Vermont National Bank, which subsequently became a part of Chittenden Bank and then uh, remains, I guess, as a, as, as a part of the, the genome of People's United Bank today, as we know. Yeah, right. The so genome. I'm not going to say any more, yeah, but I'd like the to genome. Give, yeah. give, uh, give Bob Barton a hand and welcome him this evening. Yeah, yeah. OK, great. Thank you, Ralph, and I am Bob Barton, really, and uh, thanks for being here at the, at the college. I've never been here at Marlboro speaking, so this is great. Uh, can anybody hear me? Because I can hear I'm on the mic, yeah? So we're going to start. I'm going to talk about three sub subjects tonight. I had a hard time thinking about it because it's true I'm in a lot of circles, and I was going to talk about business innovation, and then I was going to talk about how you acquire capital for venture capital, because we do venture capital as well, but I'm not talking about... So I had about 30 different things to talk about. And then I decided what would be most practical. And I thought, like, well, maybe if I talked about three financial mechanisms, there's probably 20 I could talk about that I think can be game changers and are game changers in our industry of energy, that would be helpful. And it happens at different scales. So tonight I'm going to just limit it to that. One of my handouts was, uh, actually, you guys don't have the handouts, so. But if I have a handout that gives you more finance mechanisms on a generic chart that you could take a look at as well. So I'm going to start talking about th the three mechanisms, and we're going to go here. You got it first. <laughs> Who's like, does anybody, who, know, who is this? Who, who's singing this? Josh, I can't believe you don't know this. Nobody knows who this is? Who? It, it's, uh, 
Yeah, yeah, you got it. Come on, you got it. Spit it out. Starts with an R. Randy Newman. Yeah. But anyway, we're going to talk about money tonight. And part of the reason we're talking about money, obviously, other than the fact that I know about it, is it's critical to any project that we really work with in energy. You always come across it. It's always a big challenge. And if you can't solve the money part of the energy, the technical stuff really doesn't matter. I mean, you just don't, you have projects that go nowhere. So until you solve the money problem, you're stuck. So we're going to talk about three things. I'm going to do, I'll give a two minute pitch about Catalyst, maybe 90 seconds actually. And then we'll talk about performance contracts. And then we'll talk about purchase power agreements. People call them power purchase agreements. You can do it either way. The industry sort of is interchangeable. Subcategory solar financing for those guys that are solar people here tonight. And then we're going to talk a little bit about program related investments. And what the way I've structured it is I'm going to talk for 15 minutes. And Ralph, where are you? He left? OK, Ralph's going to give me the hook after 15 minutes. And then we'll do Q&A for 15 minutes. And then so each section will be in threes. And that way, instead of me talking for like 45 minutes and then have 45 minutes of Q&A, I think you guys are going to hate it. So we'll be really interactive, like a short you know, mind dump. And then we'll talk for 15, 20 minutes together. And then we'll go to the next section. So that's the way I'm going to structure it. So Catalyst, we've been working doing this. I've personally been doing it since 1981. Uh, We've actually financed thousands of things. I said hundreds, because thousands seem like too big a number. But we've financed thousands of projects in the last 30 years. And for both commercial and public sector, this last 10 years of our, my career, and my partner's career, has been very focused on the public sector. Uh, and we've done a lot of work for utilities. So you can see some big names, like Con Edison was a client of ours for 10 years, where a lot of times utilities need to create finance programs for their customers. So they need to figure out how do we finance energy efficiency for our commercial customers or our residential customers. And really, do they want to use their own money? So they hire an outside person to actually figure out how do we design a program? You know, like NYSERDA has got a bunch of programs up. And then where do we get the money? Because we don't want to use our own money. So we've worked with a lot of utilities. Uh, we've worked with the federal government quite a bit. And then uh, in doing that, we do two roles. One is we actually get people to write checks, which is the first number, which is like convincing people that this is a good thing. <laughs> and the second piece is to basically be a financial advisor around structuring the project and all the issues, you know, and, and not necessarily getting, you know, forcing and getting people to get money. So we've done both. We've, on the financial advisory work, actually, we've done quite a bit more than that. We've probably done $3 billion total. We're working for the federal government right now. We're managing $100 million for some ARA funding that we're required to actually leverage to at least a billion, preferably two is what the feds want. And we're using public sector dollars. So uh, anyway, that's some, some of the stuff that we do. And w this basically gives the puzzle of like, we work in all these sectors here, commercial, industrial, residential. Residential is the least. It's mostly when a client like a utility would say, can you organize a residential finance program? Like we're doing that for Illinois right now. We're raising $12.5 million for the state of Illinois to do residential financing for energy efficiency. But we don't generally look at residential otherwise. So we'll go to performance contracts. So before a performance contract starts, there's generally a problem. Otherwise, the performance contractor doesn't get there. And this, like, this business had a problem. <laughs> right? Can you guys read that way back there? Now look at their creative solution. <laughs> so I don't know. I hope we don't, you know, different solutions are different solutions. I'm going to say money is always a problem when you're doing energy efficiency or renewables. So I'm going to offer a few solutions tonight that are creative as well. Uh, so for performance contracts, this is like one definition of what a performance contract is. The essential elements, because I'm not going to read the definition. You guys can see it. And as you heard, you can also get the slides. A performance contract is basically between a company that comes and markets to a, a, another company that's inefficient, a host company, and says, I can figure out how to make your building more efficient. I'll organize the capital for you, and I'm going to guarantee you savings. And I'm going to guarantee that your savings are more than a cost to actually whatever borrowing you have to do. So if you're going to save you know, a million dollars, 
you know, a year, they're going to figure out a way that it only costs you $800,000. So you have immediate positive cash flow. So from a marketing point of view, it's an opportunity for somebody who has, says, I don't have the time, I don't have the money, I don't have the expertise, to actually get their billing fixed up without having to put any time in, no, and no, none, of their own, none of their own money. The, so, and it's called performance contract. And that's what I'm going to talk about right now a bit. There's a bunch of performance contracts, and when we started this, I guess this is one of the products we actually helped finance and, and, and pioneer. In 81, we did our first performance contracts. And we were using something called fixed payment, shared savings. There's variables, there's this. And this is actually what's most current. It's called a guaranteed savings agreement. And if you could see here, 86% of all the performance contracts in the United States are done by using this one particular finance mechanism. In a few seconds, I'll talk about how big this industry is and who the players are and stuff. Uh, so this, you could tell 86% of all the performance contracting happening is happening here, so if this is a big deal. And this is where the savings are guaranteed by a Siemens or by a Johnson Controls or somebody. It's, and I'll, I'll, the public sector loves this particular mechanism. And here's the way it looks. So this is who the players are. We've got a client, right? We have an ESCO, which is the energy service company. And we have a financier. Somebody's got money. The ESCO basically takes the performance risk of the equipment. So they're the one that says, OK, we're going to guarantee this stuff's going to work. We're going to make recommendations. And it's going to work. The financier takes the credit risk. They say, well, we don't know anything about technology, so we're not going to take technology risk, but we will take the credit risk on whoever it is. <coughs> Oops. Sorry about that. You know what? That didn't position. <laughs> well, I'll have to just describe it to you because it doesn't seem to go forward here. So these, you basically are trying to weigh the way the risk is done. And you, you don't find that the customer takes all the risk. You don't take the financier doesn't take all the risk. And the ESCO doesn't take all the risk. In the early days of performance contracting, when we started, there were only three people financing in this industry. There was us, there was another company called EPC, which was acquired by ABB and then acquired by GE, and a, and a, and a utility. And now it's become, we're out of the market for the most part because it's just become incredibly competitive. And it's not that it's profitable for us. So ESCOs, first of all, they, they tend to, this is the kind of size of projects they work for. They tend to be big projects, it's like two to $50 million projects. They really are ideal for colleges and universities. And I'll talk about the sector in a second. The most important part of the proposition is that the guaranteed savings are going to be more than the cost of financing. So you always know, as long as you have a strong ESCO, a big company whose guarantee really means something, you then could, could take it to the bank. I've worked for school districts, you know, where they didn't, they didn't even trust that a Siemens wouldn't go bankrupt or a Honeywell, which is pretty hard to think that they're going to go bankrupt. So they would get ins insurance behind Honeywell and Siemens, which would you know, increase the cost of the project even more. But you know, if you've got a really conservative board, and that's the only way it's going to get passed, that's what it does. In the early part of the industry, there was a lot of charlatans. You know, like 30 years ago when we started this, half of those people con people and then they went out of business. You know, they, they didn't know how to measure stuff. They overpromised. They're almost like used, cars peop used car people. Now, the industry, quite frankly, is down to, um, this performance contract business is down to probably one dozen really pretty big companies. And there's a lot of smaller companies and regional companies, but in terms of doing large projects, there's about a dozen very, very, very strong companies. And that's driven largely by the financing. So, this is the, the size of the industry right now. So performance contracts have done about $40 billion since 1990. Uh, $50 billion were the guaranteed and verified savings. Uh, feds a long time ago realized that this industry, because people would make these promises, hey, give me your bad building. We'll fix it up. But you don't have to put any capital up. We're organized the financing for you. You know, that they were worried that this wasn't going to be true. So the feds put into place about 10 years ago, monitoring and verification protocols, which have become international protocols. And so uh, that was actually a major change in the industry and actually shifted from having people make way excessive promises. Uh, you can look, it's a little bit like a hockey stick. 
the industry has gone up. This year, it's predicted to be a $7 billion industry. It's a pretty big number. And it, there's no reason it won't keep on going, because if you don't have capital, and you don't have time, and you don't have expertise to do your energy, this is a great way to do it. If you have the capital, you have the expertise, and you have the time, do it yourself, because it's cheaper. No question, it's cheaper if you can do it yourself. But I've worked in the public sector now for 20 years, and I can tell you 99% of the people in the public sector should probably be thinking about something like this, because they just put off and put off and put off and put off doing something. They'll put off three years' worth of energy savings. So uh, this is who's served by the, by the ESCO market. Mush means municipalities, universities, schools, and hospitals. And it's, it's the industry calls it the mush sector. That's, you, as you can see, that's 69% of who gets served by this market. The feds get another 15%. Our company alone, we've done about $750 million of financing people get check writing for the federal government, and another probably a few hundred million for the must sector. Um, C&I, as you notice, this is the commercial sector here, is pretty small. And part of the reason for that is the, this kind of finance mechanism is a really deep, deep retrofit. So it's likely to take care of a roof as well which it, normally the roof wouldn't get fixed, and you can't like use savings to fix a roof. But if you do a whole bunch of measures, so you do all things that have short-term measures like lights and motors and variable speed drives, and you combine them with longer stuff like HVAC and windows, you can actually do infrastructure. So CNI people, unfortunately, they're not interested in commercial industrial, when I say CNI. They're not interested in things with long-term paybacks. They're looking for like three and five year paybacks. And if they're a publicly traded company, if you can't show them something for 18 to 24 months, it's not even worth taking them to lunch because they're probably not going to even listen. It's just not going to happen. So whereas the, the must sector has a longer mentality, and they don't mind engaging in something that has a 10 or 12 year payback and work, having a contract for 15 years. But to try to get a commercial or an industrial client to do that, really hard. And also, from a financing point of view, it's pretty hard because it's pretty hard to know who's going to be around in 10 or 15 years that's in the commercial sector, where it's likely that Bradbury is going to still be here you know, in 15 years, I hope. <laughs> so in terms of the way they make revenues, they make promises. And this is where in ESCO, for the most part, they make 70% of their money by promising that they're going to save you energy and guaranteeing and verifying it. Uh, and then they make money in different ways. But this is the key thing. They also do design build. They'll work for you and do a design build and you can own a project and there's no guarantee that it's going to work. So, but it's not a big part of the business model. Two minutes. Two minutes? Okay. I don't know how many slides I've got left. The technologies, as you can see, is energy efficiency has dominated it, this, this industry. And when we started doing this ourselves, it was only energy efficiency that we did. But now, as you can see, Renewables is coming in, and that's not something you're getting a guarantee on, but it's going to be on my next piece where we talk about PPAs, where somebody will say, we'll put your stuff in, and we'll sell you power at a certain price. Uh, so I'm glad to see that renewables is part of the performance contract industry, because these are, you can get both things, and you don't have to get just efficiency. So this is what an ESCO can do. And there's a long list, and I won't read every one of the things, but you can see they can do everything from audits to design your equipment. They'll sell you the equipment. They'll give the performance guarantees. They'll do the monitoring, the verification. They can do a lot of things. If, you get, if you're going to hire an ESCO, the things that I've put here in red are the things that you actually can't really negotiate around. They have to do those things in red, and everything else is, quite frankly, negotiable. Whereas an S, but an ESCO is not going to come into your facility and say, I guarantee you're going to save $500,000. And by the way, I don't need to do the audit. Somebody else can do it. Not going to happen. It is not going to happen. It doesn't matter who did it. It could be the Pope. I'm not going to work. You know, you're going to do another audit. So that's that. When you do a performance contract, it has three agreements, typically. It has a pro pro program development agreement, which is really an audit, a professional audit. An energy services agreement, which is the contract between you, the, the host, and the ESCO. 
and it outlines exactly all the promises, what they're going to fix, and what's going to happen, what savings are going to be by measure, and all the guarantees. And then they have a, a finance agreement as a side agreement. <laughs> and we, it's kind of, we did tongue in cheek for that because in the early days of the performance contracting, it wasn't disaggregated. And there was a utility called EUA Cogenics in Boston who would finance these contracts and they would do it at 25 to 30 percent implied interest, but nobody knew it because it was bundled into the contract. And eventually a lot of us got hold of what they were doing and we said, wait a minute, you know, you, do, you can finance these contracts in the public sector separately without it being in the contract and still have it. And so today I'm able to, I'm doing a transaction in Del for the Delaware State University for $11.3 million right now, and we, our cost of capital on that is 4.6%. 15, so 20 year financing, 4.6%. And if, if you didn't disaggregate the financing and you let the private sector do it alone, trust me, it would be at least 10 or 12 hidden in it in some way. So uh, you have different kinds of risks. I'm down to probably about a minute. <laughs> I'm, negative I'm negative, okay, I'll go crap. When you do the pricing of the project, you've got different risks and different players. And if you shifted all the risks to the ESCO, the contractor, if you could see where the consumer price goes, it gets really high. Because the contractor is taking the credit risk and also taking the commodity risk, which is the price of fuel changing. And instead, if you, if you get the customer going the other way, the customer is taking all the risk and the price is really low. But in the real world, the market's sort of like this. It gets divided where the ESCO says, I'll take the performance risk that it really works. The lender says, I'll take the credit risk that the ESCO is going to be around and also that the customer is going to be around. And then the customer says, well, nobody knows where the price of power is going to go. I'll take the risk that power can go up and down and that, that that's something we negotiate. For big jobs, they actually have, you're going to do a hedge. But, you know, for, you know, if you're doing a $20 million job, you're not going to go to interest or you're not going to go to all sorts of commodity swaps. So, and the last thing is, a question that you can ask yourselves, who needs, who could use an ESCO? Oops, sorry about that. Uh, if you're answering yes to a lot of these questions, that's where you'd want to be using an ESCO. In other words, like, I don't know how to identify my projects. I don't have the time. I don't have the expertise. What I will want to put in as a thought as I end there is that we in Vermont have Vermont Energy Efficiency, v VIC. They started doing performance contracting, and I think they could do more. I don't think they're going to be capable ever of doing large jobs just because they're not going to get it financed. It's going to be pretty hard. Um, but they could do small jobs. So they, this, this could actually happen in the United States. And when we, in the United States and Vermont, um, travel shock, it's like, what country am I in now? I mean, uh, when we started doing this financing, um, we specialized just in small companies. We actually didn't do the Siemens and the Honeywells. We looked for projects that were a million dollars and less and try to really judge the contractor on their character and their ability and then would back them. You know, so that's, that's the stuff in performance contract down. We'll leave it open now for you guys to start asking questions. All right, guys. On to the number two here. So we're gonna go to purchase power agreements or Power purchase agreements, depending upon how dyslexic you are when you're writing the slides. You know, I've done it both ways, and I, I've seen it written both ways. Most of the contracts we do actually are power purchase agreements. So first, just a little bit of background. A power purchase agreement came back you know, in 1978 under PURPA, which is the Public Utilities Act. And it was the first time that our government allowed you know, independent power producers to, and, and force utilities basically to buy the power. They said, hey, guess what, utilities? You can't be the only ones that make power. You know, we're, you, you know if Peter wants to make power, then you're going to have to buy it from him. And PURPA was the first ability to actually force utilities to buy power from an independent power producer. And so you had the, the, the rise of AES and of Calpin and other independent power producers. Um, but that was all utility scale projects, big, big, big stuff. And also long term contracts very capital intensive and super complicated. Uh, I did a lot of work for Con Edison and Niagara Mohawk, and I'll tell you, in the, in, the, in the 90s, a lot of the contracts that were under PURPA 
were so far overpriced, given that natural gas had really gone lower, that everybody wanted to get out of these purchase power contracts that, that they had signed at prices that were twice what they could already be getting in the market. But if that had happened, that would have really ruined the whole financial market because everybody that put all the money to finance this stuff would have been screwed. <laughs> and then nobody would finance the stuff again. So that wasn't allowed to happen. People had to be made whole and say, well, the contract's a contract. We may not have all seen the world right, but the fact that you signed something for eight cents and it should have been six cents now, you know, tough. <laughs> Now, this is what a, pur a purchase power agreement has these players in it. You've got the client, the financier, and the developer. But you always have a special purpose corporation because what happens is everything gets filtered to the special purpose corporation. And money goes in typically from two pieces, equity, like ownership, and it's rare that the developer themselves um, will have all the equity themselves. Uh, so you have a developer and probably private investors for most people. Then you have a, d a debt financier. So you, you try to leverage your debt as much as you can because if you can bring debt into a solar project or any, this isn't solar yet, but I'm already thinking solar, uh, you can then leverage the return that the equity investors get. Because the equity investors are pretty expensive and they, they're looking for returns of 15 to 20% minimum or they're not going to play. And they typically are going to be anywhere from 30 to 50% of the project. So to the extent that you can get debt at a lower cost, 6 or 7 or 8%, you bring down your total weighted average capital cost. And then you have a contract between the client, whoever that host entity is that wants to, you know, this purchase power agreement, and the special purpose corporation. And you wind up having the financier taking the risk of the special purpose corporation and the client, and you wind up having the developer taking the performance risk, both to the back to the special purpose corporation. And if, I mean, I spent eight hours talking about this, so you're, you're getting really like one slide of 50 slides that I could do. There's a lot of layers to this if you really want to get to understand it. Uh, but that's the essential players in the process. I think I'm going to pass on this one, because this, be, this basically winds up saying the flows of transactions goes back and forth and you'll see that it starts right here with first doing a preliminary audit and then you wind up saying well what's the credit look like because the first thing you have to really do if you want to be successful make money and energy and I certainly didn't make any money the first 10 years I did this was is to figure out can you get this freaking thing financed because the last thing you want to do as a developer is to work on a project and have this incredible dream about what's going to happen and you can't get it financed. So you have to figure that out really early, way before you do a lot of the technical studies. So you want to kind of do gross technical studies to get a feeling for what the possibility should be. But pretty soon you want to figure out, can I get this thing financed or not? And, and if you can't, you know, if it's, it really should be go, no go for you. Unless you're, you know, a honey well you where you can afford to spend fifty or hundred thousand dollars in doing technical studies and then figure out later on that I have an uncredit worthy person and they're not going to get financed anyway so I'll move on to the next thing. So PPAs could be from the energy side it could be anything and it could be longer than this list I just gave a list of where some kinds, kinds of things could, could be under a purchase power agreement. Wind right now in our country is the biggest thing under a purchase power agreement. So every wind project in the United States is done under this. Almost all solar projects, 90% of all solar projects in the United States are done under PPAs now. And I'll talk more about that. Hydro, landfill, gas, I mean, geothermal could be on here. So it could be a list of almost any renewable could be on here. I just gave a few, and I, and I put down the ones that are most popular. Biomass, landfill gas is a favorite of a lot of people. A lot of people love doing landfill gas under PPAs. So that's great for towns. You know, we had one here in Brattleboro. I actually did the financing for Dan Engel, who is not here, you know, 20, 25 years ago when he put that, the, the, did the first uh, financing here for Brattleboro. You know, it was a, just a, I think, million and a half dollar project at the time. 
So what's the benefit of a PPA so, or, or, or of, of a PPA in general? As well, one is you have no money upset because essentially what's happening is somebody under PPA is saying, I'm going to put all the money in for this energy and then you are going to buy it from me under a contract that says what the price is. So you don't put any money up, you get power lower than what you're currently paying, guaranteed for the next 20 years to be lower than what anything the utility is. <coughs> And you can have some PV and you get some good PR out of it. So it's, it's a really sweet deal for both municipalities and public sector. The ones that have done it on the solar side, I mean, these are some of the less tangible benefits. I could say the commercial people have done it. Public sector people wouldn't do it for this reason. Commercial sector people do PPAs, particularly solar PPAs, because they want off-balance sheet financing. They don't really want to the concur the debt. So why does a Staples do it? A Staples does it because it doesn't want to spend $20 million of its own money. I mean, Staples has the money, but it doesn't want to be on its balance sheet as a loan and then have this asset called solar power. You know, I mean, it's like it doesn't really increase their business. It's not well, their core business. So for them, they'd rather have I'll get the lower cost power, I'll let somebody else take all the tax benefits, which we'll talk about later, and I'll get the PR out of being green, and I don't put any money up, you know? And, and, and so I have no balance sheet impact. That's why the commercial sector does it. Public sector doesn't care about balance sheet because they're not worried about taxes and leverage and any of that stuff. So public sector does it really to be a good citizen, you know? So here's some more other risk though. So a risk would be is you have somebody that puts in all this equipment and they've guaranteed you a rate and then they go out of business. Well the good thing is you know if you're doing solar who cares? I mean it's not like rocket science. I mean there's, there's a lot of other people that can service this stuff. Even you know m even quite frankly landfill gas and these other things. There's some more nuance in some of the stuff but there's enough people around that have experience in this that you can find somebody else to do it. And the financial community, quite frankly, isn't worried about that. They're not worried about, oh my God, if this contractor goes out of business, we'll never ever get paid again. Uh, so those are some of the possible risks. The other thing is the utility prices decline. I mean, I'm not an economist, but I don't know. I, it doesn't seem like we're in an environment where you would want to predict that my utility bill is going down a lot, you know, in the next 10 years on a weighted average. It's not likely. So let's go to solar because a lot of us love solar. So we've got 19 states that actually have legislation that allows for solar PPAs. And if you notice, Vermont is not one of them, unfortunately. Because Vermont's got, you know, our little speed thing, like a speed bump, you know, it was like a, a First day it was over, it was, everybody was gone. But we got 50 megawatts of power in Vermont, and that was great, and we got way more people than 50 megawatts of power, and it's under that stuff. But like, you can't, we don't have anything that really allows people to put this in, as far as I know. Now Peter or somebody else might know, I'm not a specialist on Vermont, but I just know it's a big thing. Like, if you go to the Jazeera database, they make a big thing out of, like, these are the states that are really pushing solar. It's also, I think, the states that have solar carve-outs, you know, under their RPS standard, you know, where they say, the, you know, you have to have 3% of your power coming from this or 5%. This probably coincides with the states that are using a solar carve-out standard. Well, in general, to make the economics work, the, the investors are looking for, I don't think I have it here, but the investors are really looking for the tax, like right now we have the 30% tax credit or the grant, they want the grant, they want the accelerated depreciation, and they want the right to sell the RECs. And then if they don't have the right to sell the RECs, I mean, it's sort of, it's, a, it's like that thing I had with the, you know, the price, it's like, okay, we don't have RECs, guess what, your, your price of power goes up. Okay, cool, it's not 14 cents, it's 18 cents, because it's gonna give some place. You, you know, so, uh, so a big evolution was Sun Edison, any, I don't know if anybody you guys know that company, but Sun Edison did in 2002, it started the first time saying, all right, we wanna, we've got PURPA, let's start installing solar under purchase power agreements. And that's when they started doing this stuff to the big box stores. But unfortunately, I mean, well, not unfortunately, it was good because it was a big evolution. They did it, to, they did it because the financing side d demanded that it, they really only use investment grade clients because the financial community wasn't willing to have a 20 or 25 year contract 
with Joe Blow's uh, grocery store, you know? And they said, sure, well, we gotta go out that long. We want it to be a really strong financial client. So that's a weakness of this program, quite frankly. It does require pretty strong end users. Otherwise, it's very, very hard to get financed. Um, two minutes, okay. Uh, <laughs> but you, you, you did a little Q&A, so. I did a little Q&A there, so. all right, good. Uh, the next evolution, which I think to me is the most exciting because it becomes more grassroots, is now you have people like Sunrun, I'm sure Pablo knows, Solar City. Solar City. These are guys that are starting to do the smaller projects. They're not, just, they're not just like the Sun Edisons and the Tiogas of the world, where they say, hey, we can do smaller projects and we're going to figure out how do you monetize this tax credit, because that's the complex part is like, how do I get my head around all these little moving pieces and do it and not go bankrupt? And, and that's why the projects have been big, because the lawyers t tend to charge, well, Peter was saying 150,000 on your project, but I've certainly looked at projects where the legal fees have been 350 to 500 on a bigger project, just to close it, which I think is obscene, and hopefully we, uh, I could say a great thing that's actually happened, which is not on my slides, is that a group called Tioger, T-I-O-G-A, G-A Energy, out of San Francisco, just put their, their purchase power agreement into the public domain. And they did like open architecture, per, per, you know. So if you Google Tioga, you could both look at the purchase power agreement and they have an annotated, annotated version of it. And that is really cool, because that's revolutionary, because they're saying, you know what? I'm tired of paying lawyers $250,000 on every goddamn deal we close. If we put this in the public domain, smart people are going to figure out how to standardize this. And people are going to rally around not being willing to continue to have to pay ridiculous fees and negotiation stuff, which I think was smart. It only happened last week. So I'm psyched about that. You know? I wrote the guy a note right away. I said, man, I am so happy you did that. Uh, T-I-O-G-A. But if you Google purchase power agreements, it's like the buzz right now. I mean, it's, it hasn't maybe hit Brown yet, but it, it's coming <laughs> real soon. And the other thing, other thing that's super cool that I, I learned this week, and I think everybody that's here, uh, uh, Peter and Pablo, how many else people are here are contractors? I know there are two. Anybody else? So two? Well, you guys three, okay. Uh, this company called Green Zoo, has just started doing solar PPAs down to $50,000. And they figured out the magic juice how to do this. And they will work with other contractors to help them and do the financing for them, which is cool. That's why I said I had a magic bullet for you. And I, don't, I haven't talked to them yet, but I'm going to talk to the CEO and find out like what's the deal. There's, you, know, you have to kind of see the whole thing. But if it's as good as they make it sound on paper, that would be great because you're really setting you're taking a great concept that has only been applied to the big dogs, then you get the middle, the middle dogs, and now we're down to, wow, we're down to pretty small projects. I mean, we could get a lot of people. I mean, you know, you could have done, and that actually opens the market up a lot. And then this group here is a nonprofit that's starting to just specialize in doing solar PPAs for schools, and they're in Massachusetts. So we've really gone from like PURPA, you know, to all right, we're going, and, and it's getting better, and I actually feel very positive about it, because I mean, solar's got a huge, bright, bright, bright future, and even though I have thought of that 30 years ago when I started this, it's really the time. We're at the right time now, so. So here's the economics. Customer gets a lower rate, no upfront cost, can buy the system, like you were saying at the end. Typically, a lot of times it's a 15-year contract extended for five years, and then at the end of the five-year period, it's yours for free. Or they can say, oh, if you really want to buy it the 15th year, here's a, for tax purposes, it has to be fair market value for a long time. And that's the challenge, because if it's not fair market value, it's considered a bargain purchase option, and then that puts it in a different tax category. There's all sorts of legal issues. So, so you really want to do it the right way, but this is a good thing. And then the investor gets basically Revenue from the sale, you know, they get the SREX. I'm using SREX versus REX. They're getting the tax credits and the depreciation. Right now, the depreciation is awesome. It's, you've got like this accelerated one-year depreciation, which effectively is 85% of the equipment cost, which is, I mean, I'm looking at solar projects now that are being brought to us, 
and we're new to doing the solo stuff because we've really done a lot of the energy stuff, where the rates of return to investors leveraged is 40% a year, you know? Now, I'm not saying they should get that, but that's what's available. And, and, uh, and, and until we create an infrastructure and, and an investor base that's willing to take less, that's what we're gonna have to pay because the investor community then gets very, well, if I can get that, then I'm gonna take that, you know? So eventually we wanna be able to build up the capacity within Vermont to have individual investors. And that's the way Green Zoo, Green Zoo saw it. They said, you know, they go to individual investors to do these small projects. They don't go to the big dogs and these big houses because no, they won't do it. They're looking for people that care in their, these communities to invest it back in their community. All right, so the, the, the third mechanism, it's not specifically related to PRI. PRI's program-related investments is done by foundations. It is not limited to energy. And that's the kind of the cool thing, and I thought that was the reason. I tried to bring a non-energy thing in because I felt like I, I hogged the show with all energy for the first two. Program-related investment is that foundations have the right to invest you know, money as well as uh, donate money. And a PRI has been around for a long time. And we've used it in situations, I think of it as non-traditional financing, where you can't get the traditional financial community to do a deal. And so a foundation generally provides a low interest loan. It can provide a guarantee, it can do lines of credit. Uh, as you see here, transactions are from 10 to $50 million. So it's not like this is chump change, you know? This could be pretty big. 84% uh, of, the, of the PRIs are over a million dollars. And so essentially that would mean that you could go to, we're actually, Vermont Community Foundation is thinking about doing PRIs. I bet you New Hampshire Charitable has probably done it. Uh, I don't know, because Lou Felstein was pretty, pretty smart. Question about that, um, in terms of the vehicles, the, the, the for-profit Yeah. They are, yeah. A PRI, and I, I, I'll give us some data on that, yeah. They, they can, this is what's been invested, but he was asking, who could you invest in? They are allowed, they more likely will invest in a nonprofit and a low interest loan, but they also do a lot like, uh, Amory Levins is a good friend of mine, and he's done a lot of spinoffs out of RMI. And RMI has been a master of getting program related investments in every for profit entity they've ever created. I mean, they have gotten tens of millions of dollars. And so you can have a, a PRI in a program, in a, in a for-profit company, whether it's owned or not owned by, uh, uh, by a, a, found, a, a non-profit. So here's some of the numbers. You can see they're pretty impressive, but it's also pretty concentrated in a sense of 173 foundations out of 75,000. I mean, it's like, this is not really spread yet. It's been around a long time, but it's, it's still not, popular with the masses yet, you know? And part of it is it's more complicated and foundations would rather just give money away than think about, oh wow, I have to do like a credit decision and then I have to do a document and what if it doesn't work? Well, a lot of them don't work. But um, you could see the, also the increase, even though there's only been $3.7 billion done, which is not that huge amount of money, $734 million was done between 206 and 207. So it's really accelerating fast, because if you divide 3.7 by 19, it's a way smaller number. You know, you're at you know, $70 million average. And now you've got 734. So it's increasing quite a bit. And it's a really popular mechanism. And part of the reason it's popular is foundations are saying, we have a limited capital base. So if we just keep giving them away, eventually, you know, and in most foundations, unfortunately, they do the 5% rule. They're, by law, they're, they are, have to give away 5% of their corporate base every year. The really progressive ones, like Levinson, that wasn't, you know, and a, like, uh, quite a few that I know, they've just made the position like, we're gonna give it away, and we never should have kept this forever. You know, we were lucky enough to have this money, and we are gonna give it away as fast as we can. That is really unusual, and the, the usual is more like, I want a legacy, I want everybody to be talking about me for a thousand years, you know? And so they, they give it, they dribble it out, you know? They give the least they can possibly give out by law. So they could have boardroom meetings forever, you know, about this. <laughs> but in, some of those are saying also, if I lend money out and I get it back, I can keep recycling it. So this is the recycling of money for foundations. And it's become popular also 
with uh, donor advice trusts. So if you like Vermont, I mean, there's, you know, people that have donor advice trusts tend to like this because they're individuals, they're smaller, and they get the, the logic of it, and they say, hey, great, you know, if I can lend out money at 2% to my favorite things and it comes back, and I can do that 30 times rather than just making one, one donation, I'm more excited. And actually, it is pretty cool. This is who's sort of getting the funding right now, and if you see, it's very high in education. Not so high in the environment, but that's the categories of people getting the funding. Affordable housing gets a lot. The guys in affordable housing, that's the net life of the world. Net life has probably put $100 million into affordable housing and the PRI, so the foundation. Here's some of the big dogs. You know, I took from the foundation center, I, I, didn't, I knew the slide couldn't do 25, so I took the first five of the top 25. But you can see it's not a small amount of money that they've done for PRI. So it's, it's worth knowing about the sector. And it's also, you can see that the top 25 are almost 70% of the money that goes away. Because if, if you've got $734 million going out, but tw top 25 do 534. So you have a lot of money being given away by the larger foundations. But the cool thing is that the smaller foundations like it, and I think we're going to see, a, you know, even though 173 isn't a big number, I mean, today it's probably 200. Uh, I think over time, you know, we have such a huge transference of wealth that's happening right now. I mean, in our country, is going through the largest transfer of wealth in our ever history. We have a lot of people that are going to inherit. Not me. I'm not one of them. My parents are dead, and I'm not going to inherit a thing. But there's a lot of people that are going to inherit a lot of money. And, and so it's going to be in the hands, the power is going to be in a different hands. It's not going to be in grandpa and stuff like that. And I know some of my clients, I mean, I have clients that are inheriting $50 million, you know. It's like a lot of money, and they're so, way more successfully progressive than their family was. So we will see, I think, a lot more of this as time goes on. I think this, this, is, not gonna, this is a trend that we're going to keep seeing. Like sort of like recycling 20 years ago, I remember I, when I was in Keene, we promoted, we, we tried to get a $5,000 grant in Keene from the Manadoc Energy Project with Kia Island. And we were turned down by the city because they thought it was the worst use of public money possible. And now, <laughs> it's like changed a little bit, you know, thinking, okay, all right. So here's some examples. You know, PRIs tend to be a lot with loan, just loans. The good thing is, it's it literally is way lower than you're going to get from a bank or someplace else. It's on very concessionary terms. Underwriting is very simple compared to, it varies by foundation. So it's not like every foundation is super easy. But the point of this is, these guys are ready to convert this to a grant. So they know that if this doesn't work as a loan to loan, they are prepared to make it into a grant. So that's a very different mentality than a bank that wants, you know, this is a loan, this is a loan, this is a loan. And it's only a loan. So it's a very different source of capital. Uh, here's some of the project areas where you see support. You know, building and renovation is a big one, 25%. So that actually bodes really well for us, even though energy itself wasn't so huge. Specific projects are the highest, and that's mostly operating capital. So that's good because it means it allows people with really innovative projects that can't afford, they don't have enough grant money to get off the ground, but they have a great concept and they don't need to necessarily build and buy your land, but they need working capital. So the foundations will give them working capital at a low interest, you know, whereas they couldn't, maybe couldn't get it from a bank, you know, or they, maybe they didn't qualify for an SBA loan or something. Two, two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, we'll do it. Uh, here's an example of, of, of some of the, I took some of the, the, didn't take the top, I wanted to give different kinds of grants so you could see they were, went through different grants, but one is a, a Catholic school for $50 million. Opportunity Finance Network is actually a micro-lending network. So that's a, that's a really super socially progressive network. Everybody probably knows Trust for Public Land. Uh, charter schools, I don't know, I would, interesting, I don't know whether Pinelands is a for-profit or a non-profit meat company. I have to bet with about 90% certainty it's organic and it's probably, you know, I'm sure it has all the qualities that everyone here in the room would want. <laughs> if you eat meat, I mean, for those of us that are meat eaters still. Uh, and then we got a loan fund. So, it, you know, it can be really all over the place. And I was just going to just let, remind everybody that financing is a commodity. Money is. So, 
All right, questions. Quite frankly, what Vermont should do, if, if, if I had to have one silver bullet of a gem from Bob Barton, I would say we need to work to force every utility in the state to do on-bill tariff financing. That's what we need to do. We need to get every utility, Central Vermont Public Service, Green Mountain Power, to do on-bill tariff financing. And we probably won't do it. But you know, I'm working in Illinois right now where the state of Illinois has forced every utility to do that. And I'm, that's where I'm raising $12.5 million for them. Huh? OK, so what that is, that is the closest thing you get to PACE. And what it, it provides a lot of real, real benefits. Because on-bill tariff on financing is where I take a loan out as a business or as a residential one. I make my energy improvement, or I make my residential or renewables, whatever it is. And I make my payment on my bill with my regular utility bill. But if I leave my house, it stays with the meter. And it goes to the next customer. Because the next customer inherits the same the efficiency. It's been used for like 17 years. I mean, we started this stuff for base state gas 17 years ago. It's never caught on because regulators hate it. You, I, mean, I mean, not regulators, utilities hate it. Because for them, it's like another pain in their butt. It's another thing they have to do. But that's where public policy comes into place saying, and why it's really sexy is because if I I'm not really taking a loan out, so it doesn't affect my balance sheet. If I'm a business and I have on-bill tariff financing, why I use the word tariff, it means then that all the money for that gets put back into the rate base. So if there's any losses, the utility doesn't have the losses, so they don't have to complain. And the customer doesn't have a liability. I mean, I could give you lots of examples of on-bill financing. Right now, Midwest Energy, out of Kansas, is, the state of Kansas is a client of ours. They've got $34 million error fund. And the way that they're making their error funds get out, go out the door fast, everything is on-bill tariff utility financing. It's going to do energy improvements. So what they're doing is, in their case, the way they've done it is they give it to the utility for free, and then the utility you know, the energy improvement happens through the contract, or the contract gets paid, and then the customer pays back on their utility bill, the bill. Did they, did it go back into a fund that gets relent? And it gets relent forever. It's a revolving loan fund. It goes on and on and on. Yeah. So now you can recycle the money, too. So you have a lot of leverage. That's where, when I was saying we're working with clients with $100 million of ARA funds, and we have to get it to a billion. We're figuring ways to recycle money, use leverage, you know, use loan loss reserves, credit enhancement, different ways to bring the private sector in. Private sector, you know, uh, well, it winds up, Illinois is unusual in the sense that because it's legislated there that you have to do it. The utilities also, and it's tariff, meaning the utilities get it back on the rate base if there's a loss. The utility is essentially the guarantor of the loan and it's just a residential customer because the customer is going to pay it. But if they don't pay it, the utility can put it back on the rate base. So when you, when, you, when you sell that to the financial world, it's, like, it's almost like lending to the utility. So we've got to build mass mechanisms so that, I mean, like, for example, in Pennsylvania, they have a, a finance program called you know, Pennsylvania Help that a friend of mine, Peter, uh, uh, runs for AFC First. He's able to put out. The, no matter what money he has, he can get it put out through a contractor base because a contractor can go in a home, do an energy audit, be a, the customer is approved within five to six minutes while the contractor's right there. They know exactly what they're being approved for. The, the, the loan is 699 if you do prescriptive measures like you just get an air conditioner or something else. But if you do a whole house audit and you really do a whole house system approach and you do the right thing for your house, it's 299. So somebody's getting a 10-year 299 loan, you know, and they get approved within you know, a few minutes, and they can have the paperwork in the next two to three days. That sells stuff. Where you know? is that money coming from? Uh, the money, well, they've had a few pots of money. In Pennsylvania, the first 20 million came out of an enlightened state policy. The state treasury said, we want to help our citizens do something. So we invest our money in the stock market. And then they look and they go, oh, well, we've lost money in the stock market a lot. A lot of money. Hmm. We lost money in the bond market, too. So why don't we actually invest in our citizens? What a novel idea. So they're going to invest in their citizens at 5% interest for 10 years. So they put $20 million up of their own money out of the state coffers, not as a grant, as an investment instead of putting it into the public market. And that started with Keystone Help. And then they blew the money away. They've gone through $54 million worth of loans in the last few years. And now, I mean, it's a good example where 
financing drives that market because people want access. What people want is convenience, and the, the people will pay more to have the convenience. So, and the people want a reasonable rate. It doesn't have to be the lowest rate. So I've advised a lot of my clients who said, we're going to do zero interest loan programs. And I say, that's a waste of your public money. You don't need to go to zero. You, know, you need to go to the point where the, where's the tipping point to get people to act? You don't need to go to zero is way too much. You know, Austin, Texas you know, has been doing this for eight years. And they're a great example. And you know, there's a lot of great examples we can follow.